Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. And this first story may not go easily into your brain. Black holes, the great voids that gravitationally let nothing escape, may be responsible for the light that made our universe what it is today. This seeming contradiction is because the gravity of black holes extends beyond their event horizons and can create environments that glow brightly in the night. As a reminder, when the universe was formed, everything was energy. Over time, it expanded and cooled, allowing the first ionized particles to form. And eventually, about 400,000 years after T equals zero, it cooled enough for atoms to form. These neutral atoms form a universal fog that would have hidden the first light of for the first stars from view. Some combination of things, however, emitted ultraviolet light capable of ionizing that gas and creating the transparent universe we enjoy today. One of JWST's primary tasks is to identify what all is responsible for that reionization, but impatient astronomers decided to do what they could using other scopes looking at our modern universe to understand what may in the past. According to a University of Iowa press release, astronomers identified a black hole a million times as bright as our sun that may have been similar to the sources that powered the universe's reionization. That black hole is powerful enough to punch channels in its respective galaxy, allowing ultraviolet photons to escape and be observed. This work is published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and Responding author Phil Carrot explains the implication is that outflows from black holes may be important to enable escape of the ultraviolet radiation from galaxies that reionized the intergalactic medium. Let's break that down. Material flowing in toward the supermassive black hole in the center of galaxies heats up. This generates light and a magnetic field. The magnetic field creates outflows of material that clear away stuff that might block the light from the galaxy center. That light, the ultraviolet light capable of ionizing hydrogen, shone out cha and changed our universe forever. So while we may think of black holes as monsters waiting to devour stars and planets, which they are, they are also the necessary foundations for all the physics that made our modern universe possible. The universe is full of wonderful contradictions. One of the things I love about doing this show is it allows me to read about research in a lot of different areas of space science and learn things I would probably miss if I was focused strictly on doing my own research. Today's second story is the delightful tale of two stars, likely born together, that are entering their final stages side by side while enjoying a not entirely healthy companionship. Discovered as a bright, mysterious gamma ray source by the Fermi Space Telescope, this system cataloged 4FGL J1120.0-2204 was observed with the SOAR telescope. In visual light, observers found two interacting stars a very young pulsar, a type of neutron star, and an almost white dwarf. The pulsar would have formed through the death of a massive star that went supernova. And the soon-to-be white dwarf formed from a star smaller than the sun. These two sizes of star, massive and smaller than the sun, shouldn't be dying at the same time. But the smaller star appears aided by the neutron star pulling off its atmosphere. With customary dark humor, astronomers refer to the neutron star that is eating its companion as a spider. What got me about this story was the time scales. In textbooks, we simply say sun-like stars will puff off their outer atmospheres to form a planetary nebula as their core collapses into a white dwarf. Lead astronomer Samuel Swillhart explains, currently the smaller star is bloated and is about five times larger in radius than normal white dwarfs with similar masses. It will continue cooling and contracting and in about two billion years, 
It will look identical to many of the extremely low mass white dwarfs that we already know about. That, and it collapses into a white dwarf, that takes more than two billion years. The time scales of our universe are long and every white dwarf we see represents billions of years of evolution. Even when that evolved star got helped along by a hungry spider of a neutron star. After a break, we're gonna look at a new Starlink rocket launch and some of the consequences. Stay tuned. And now for something different, a rocket launch with me, Eric Mattis. On January 19th at 0202 UTC, the Starlink 35 mission launched atop Falcon 9 Boost 1060 from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This launch was yet another use of the relatively new southern launch trajectory with the Space Launch Delta 45 range operators warning the public before launch the exclusion zones would be different and to stay out. This is the first launch for Booster 1060, which successfully landed on the drone ship a short trial of Gravitas about eight minutes after launch. It joins three other boosters in the 10th flight or more club, 1049, 1051, and 1058. Together, these four boosters have flown nearly a third of all Falcon 9 launches. Let's watch that landing. Now coming up in just a few seconds, we will have the start of our stage one landing burn. This will be another about 20 second burn. Hopefully it will land us on our drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas. Stage two, terminal guidance. In the Atlantic Ocean. Stage one, start up. Here's the start of our stage one landing burn. Cool views of the drone ship approaching. Stage one landing leg deploy. Stage one landing leg Both fairings were reused, each on their second flight on a Starlink mission. All 49 satellites were successfully deployed in search of their 53.2 degree inclination orbit 15 minutes after launch. While I recognize a lot of people have returned to a fairly normal life now that we have vaccines, I have to admit I'm one of the high risk individuals who is still not really leaving my house. This means my world has become the before times, the infinite blurs day of plague times, and a question mark over the future as I wonder how much different the post-COVID world is going to be. One of the weird leaps the world is making is toward a sky filled with low Earth orbit satellites. In early 2020, the last face-to-face -face American Astronomical Society meeting I or anyone attended highlighted the potential social good and astronomical horror of the still novel Starlink satellites. We all wrote our think pieces and went home to experience a pandemic. And I have to admit that not nearly as much energy has gone into worrying about this tiny spacecraft as might have been expended if we were actively hosting star parties, observing sessions with students, or otherwise just going out to observe the now interrupted sky. While many, is a, while many of us have literally stayed home, survey telescopes have continued their largely robotic missions to seek out the things that flicker, flare, and move in the night. One particularly successful scope, the Palomar Zwicky Transient Facility, has been doing its best to alert us to scientifically awesome supernovae. And in a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, to scientifically disturbing satellite starlinks. In this paper, led by Premex Moores, researchers document the ever-increasing impact of Starlinks on their images. According to Moores, in 2019, 0.5% of twilight images were affected, and now almost 20% are affected. This is where I need to let you know the kinds of asteroids astronomers are most worried about are the kind we are most likely to discover in the twilight sky near the sun. Those images are important. The reason only twilight images are affected is because the current starlinks are so low in the sky 
that they are in the Earth's shadow about the time twilight ends. Missions in much higher orbits can be illuminated longer and affect more of the night. Moores goes on to say, We don't expect Starlink satellites to affect non-twilight images. But if the satellite constellation of other companies goes into higher orbits, this could cause problems for non-twilight observations. As we have quantified that Starlink will cause harm to our ability to do science, including the kinds of science that watches for incoming asteroids, it is important to remember that Starlink promises that it will open the world to high-speed internet. Right now, I want proof. I know of many affluent people who have Starlink for their cabins in the woods, their homes off the grid, and the like. I want to see Starlink doing good and helping us reconnect in emergencies and making the world safer. There are amazing opportunities for Starlink to prove itself. They could readily partner with aid agencies to take solar panels and Starlink ground stations to Tonga and other places knocked offline by natural disasters. If we are going to need to lose our sky, I want to see us regain contact with one another. All right, before this becomes any more editorial, let's look at Mars with Beth Johnson. Stay tuned for carbon-based science after the break. At least when we're exploring other planets, we don't have to worry about satellites clogging up our images or data stream. We hope. And it's a good thing, too, since scientists have been analyzing recent data collected by NASA's Curiosity rover that has led to headlines everywhere being less than circumspect and a little baby. While analyzing samples taken from the high field drill hole on Vera Rubin Ridge in Gale Crater, researchers found what they deemed an intriguing carbon signature. They found that the powder in this sample was strongly depleted in carbon-13, one of two stable carbon isotopes. Earth depletion of this sort can be caused by the ultraviolet degradation of biological methane. Take a moment to giggle over cow farts and then let's move on. How do we know the sample is reduced in this particular isotope? Christopher H. House, lead author of the new paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, explains. The amounts of carbon-12 and carbon-13 in our solar system are the amounts that existed at the formation of the solar system. Both exist in everything, but because carbon-12 reacts more quickly than carbon-13, looking at the relative amounts of each in samples can reveal the carbon cycle. So, Curiosity samples a rock by drilling into its surface. Then another instrument heats the sample to separate out various chemicals. Finally, the sample is analyzed spectrographically, and the spectra tells us what was actually in the sample, including the relative proportions of different isotopes. They compare those proportions with what is already known to exist in our solar system, and voila, carbon-13 was relatively absent. Now, about those headlines. Yes, on Earth we see a depletion of carbon-13 that can be due to the breakdown of biogenic methane, whose composition is CH4, one carbon to four hydrogen. The methane is broken down, the carbon escapes into the atmosphere. However, there are two other possibilities for this process a cosmic dust cloud, or that same ultraviolet breakdown, but carbon dioxide instead of methane. And carbon dioxide can easily come from volcanic activity on Mars, which definitely would not mean life. No counting Martian chickens before you find shells or skeletons. I want to back up just a moment and explain just how a cosmic dust cloud could be involved, because it's an interesting point in the press release being overlooked in the media. Per the release, to create a layer that Curiosity could sample, the galactic dust cloud would have first lowered the temperature on a Mars that still contained water and created glaciers. The dust would have been deposited on top of the ice and would then need to remain in place once the glacier melted, leaving behind a layer of dirt that included the carbon. But we have limited evidence for past glaciers on Mars, particularly in Gale Crater, so while the explanation is plausible, more evidence is required to back that particular possibility up. And while Mars has definitely had active volcanoes in the past and may even have underground magma chambers currently, it's also possible that any past methane may have an abiogenic source, since 
Mars is not Earth, and the two planets are very different. Regardless, this newly discovered carbon signature points to the possibility of an unusual carbon cycle on Mars. But more data is needed to confirm the signature and pinpoint the cause. That doesn't mean it wasn't life. I don't want to completely quash anyone's hopes in that respect. Microbial mats are still very much a possibility. We need to take more samples and keep looking around Gale Crater, and we definitely need person to keep looking over in Jezero Crater as well. After all, life uh, finds a way, right? After the break, we'll be back with This Week in Rocket History and some rocket stats for the week. Stay tuned. This week in Rocket History, the second of two joint American-German missions to explore the main solar processes and solar terrestrial relationships launched in 1976. The two Helio spacecraft were built by the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, which made them the first spacecraft not built in the United States or USSR to leave Earth orbit. Each Helio spacecraft had 10 instruments from both Germany and the United States. The seven major instruments were detectors for different particles, from electrons to zodiacal light to Cherenkov radiation. Each probe also had three different magnetometers. Most of the funding was provided by West Germany. The major contribution of the U.S., besides the two in of the instruments, was the Titan 3E, also called Titan Centaur Launch Vehicle, for the two missions. Helios A was launched in 1974, with Helios B to follow two years later after the launches of the Viking 1 and 2 Mars lander, also on Titan 3E rockets during the critical 1975 Mars window. Another constraint was the need to use large deep space network with dishes to support the Mars landings in 1976. The Helios probes were spin stabilized, mainly to reduce heat. They weighed only 370 kilograms each because of the capability of the rocket and the low solar orbit necessary for the mission. The main antenna was on a special platform that spun in the opposite direction to keep it pointing in the right to keep it pointing in the right direction. The spacecraft solar panels were designed to be perpendicular to the sun to reflect heat and the spacecraft was also fitted with quartz second surface mirrors to reflect a total of 96% of the heat away from the spacecraft. Finally, the spacecraft had movable radiators on the top and bottom of the spacecraft body to further shed heat. Between the two Helios launches, engineers took the time to approve Helios B based on the early information from Helios A. The spacecraft's maneuvering engines were upgraded. Its instruments were modified to let it detect uh, new things, such as gamma ray bursts. Helios B launched on January 15, 1976, on the fifth Titan III from Slick 41, the same launch pad that the modern Atlas V rocket launches from today. The launch was nominal, unlike the first Titan 3E, which was detonated 12 minutes into the flight after the Centaur upper stage malfunctioned. After launch, Helios B's first perihelion was on April 17, 1976, at a distance of 0.29 astronomical units, 3 million miles, th 3 million kilometers closer than Helios A. This record stood until the Parker Solar Probe in 2021. Helios B also observed the comet C-1975 V1 West, C-1978 H1 Meyer, and C-1971 Y1 Bradfield. Its capability to detect gamma ray bursts was to get a longer baseline from the gamma ray burst detecting satellites in Earth orbit, which allowed for a much finer location of the burst, down to two arc minutes, compared to the solely Earth-based measurements that were much worse, basically circumstantial, and didn't allow for any analysis of the events. This increased precision allowed the scientists of the day to determine that the gamma bursts were, they were observing were distinct from all other types of celestial X-ray objects, bursters, and gamma ray sources known at the time. Scientists have since learned that the same events that cause gamma ray bursts also make gravitational waves the merger of neutron stars. Helios B's downlink transmitter failed in March 1980, preventing it from sending back any more data. It was shut down a year later to prevent it from interfering with other spacecraft. 
There are still eight toilets in space, four on the ISS and one each on the Soyuz, Crew Dragon, Shenzhou 13, and Tianta. We keep track of orbital launches by where they launch from, also known as space warp. Here's that breakdown. USA, four. China, one. From those five launches, 211 satellites have been put into orbit. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash cosmoquestx.